Hey, it's Gerald from Lakers Fast Break. Anchor is the easiest way to make your next podcast. It's absolutely free, and their creation tools will allow you to record and edit your show right from your phone or your home computer. Anchor will then distribute your podcast for you so it can be heard on great podcast outlets like Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Radio Public, Google Podcasts, and many more. You can even make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. It's everything you need to make a podcast all in one place. So download the free Anchor app today or go to anchor.fm to get started on your next podcast. with another episode of the Lakers Fast Break Podcast. It's Gerald Glassford coming right back at you here from Pop Culture Cosmos, Lakers Fast Break, Inside Sports Fantasy Football, and Game Source. We truly appreciate everyone out there listening to all of our great shows. If you get a chance, please, 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 not only this my guest shows, but also mine as well. If you can give us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts, we would truly appreciate it. We cannot thank you enough for doing so. If you also like internet radio, Go ahead and check us out on the Discover Community Network, on their podcast outlets, and then also as well, you can check us out every Monday and Wednesday on the RTF Sports Network. But my friends out there, just wanted to go ahead and say thank you for listening. You know, when we're recording this, it is a truly important and historic day, June 19th, Juneteenth. Uh, every, you know, everything is being celebrated right now as far as, especially in light of what's going on. And I just wanted to go ahead and say I appreciate my guest for being here on such an important day. And he is back once again, just a truly awesome guest every time out. He is not the New York Knicks general manager, but he plays one on YouTube. You can check out that great video today. If he was the New York Knicks GM, what would he do? You can check that out on NBA Draft Junkies. Plus, also check out his awesome podcast, NBA Draft Junkies, as well. And again, give that a five-star review, plus his site, NBADraftJunkies.com. He is the man behind it all. It is Rafael Barlow. And Rafael, again, thank you for taking the time to speak to me on such an important day. No problem. Thank you for having me as a guest. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, you know, I think I've gotten you in the habit of becoming a podcast guest because I saw your appearance that's a, on an upcoming episode of Catch You on the Rebound podcast right there. So looks like you're becoming a wanted man out there. <laughs> Maybe in small circles, but it's always good to be able to talk about stuff that I enjoy talking about. And obviously basketball, the, the Catch the Re- Catch Me on the Rebound podcast it was a little bit about basketball. I had a basketball foundation, but it was more so about like just mental health. And so it was different for me to talk about that as opposed to or at least talk about that on like a public forum. Well, if you ever want to go ahead and speak out on it here or speak about how people can find out more information or, or anything that, uh, that you feel you want to talk about, the floor is always open for you right here at the Lakers Fast Break. I appreciate that. No problem, my friend. And, yes, we are going to touch on your time and your tenure uh, working, unfortunately, for James Dolan as the New York Knicks GM later on in the broadcast. Not only your time doing it and what you, your plans are for doing uh, you know, that role of GM again going forward, but I want to hear the inevitable feedback that you got from New York Knicks fans because I was talking to Stone Hansen the other day about his mock drafts and whatnot, and I said, do you get the kind of feedback that Rafael Barlow gets on the New York Knicks? He said, no, but I'm not exactly, you know, he just the way he was alluding to it, it just seems like you're not the only one that gets that kind of feedback from New York Knicks fans. Yeah, I mean, they have a large fan base, just like the Lakers. And I imagine if if I would have put myself out like this last year with the Lakers fan base and I had, I don't know, someone that fans didn't like. Well, I mean, I don't think – necessarily some of the fans don't like it. It's just there's so many fans and there's going to be a divide regardless. 
Unless if, it, if there was a high draft pick, like the yeah. year that they had Lonzo Ball or mm-hmm. the year that they had Brandon Ingram, yeah, that's that's probably wouldn't you would have gotten the yeah you know, the same type of feedback from Lakers fans because, as you know, Lakers fans can be a kind of a, a vocal in their yeah. opinions from time to time. So. Especially if they were picking like sixth or seventh, you know, if it's number one or number two, there's not many options as far as who you think would take number one or number two, but six or seven, especially in a draft like this, the bigger the fan base, the more people that are going to agree with the pick, but the more people that are going to dislike it. So, but that's just part of putting yourself out there when you have like a podcast or a website, you've got to deal with the good and the bad. This is true, my friend. This is all too true. I mean, you're talking to someone here who's received comments of praise, and he's also received many comments as well about my voice, which I've told you off the air, which I won't go into detail here right now. But yes, uh, I know. But it's going to be a great show we got for you today. We're going to be talking about a lot of uh, issues heading to the NBA. And first off, thank goodness Adam Silver or he is bald. Because if he wasn't bald, he would have lost all of his hair by now with all the things that are going on as we're just making the final decisions on which NBA players are going to Orlando because they must decide by the 24th. They were handed this week or they were sent out this week a 100 plus page outline for the coronavirus in the Orlando bubble. So I want to hear your thoughts. And this is going to lead also into the divide amongst players. Uh, you know, I know you heard about it. I mean, I understand it's very restrictive and it's very precise and specific, but it is outlined in its detail to go ahead and prevent players as best as possible, whoever heads down to Orlando, from getting this virus. Yeah, I I understand why some people don't like it because it may seem like they're being treated like kids. I actually saw a, a tweet where it was a parent that saw, I guess he read the, the whole outline, and he said it was pretty much the same thing as when they had the um, the junior NBA tournament there. <laughs> so basically the these professional athletes and, and multimillionaires are pretty much getting the same treatment that the 12- and 13-year-olds got when they played at the junior NBA worldwide sports. But it, I understand why the NBA is being so strict because – I mean, the numbers aren't going down. I mean, you you look at the the numbers, especially even in Florida. I live in Texas, and the numbers in Texas are going up. And so, I mean, you know it's all money motivated. The league wants to generate that, or you know, the revenue, because I, I think I read it's like $900 million or something like that. So, of course, they want to play, but they also want to make sure that the players are safe and protected. Because, you know, if it's – and I don't want to just name a name, but if it's the ninth man in the rotation for the New Orleans Pelicans, it's not going to have the same impact if it's LeBron or Kawhi or Giannis. And so they just really want everyone to be in this bubble and, and make sure everyone's safe. Then I heard, uh, I forgot who it was, but it was on the Ringer podcast where they said LeBron needs to be in bubble wrap and he needs to ride around in the Pope Mobile. I heard that as well. <laughs> I remember that being said. <laughs> yeah. It makes sense. It, you know, it makes a lot of sense because I think if something were, if, you know, if he were, God forbid, but if he were to test positive for it, I, I think the league would probably shut down. Exactly. I mean, Kawhi and Giannis, you want them also uh, in hazmat suits running around there. (laughs) Of anyone, if LeBron gets it and LeBron is affected by it, not only does it hurt the Lakers' chances, but it hurts the visibility of the league as a whole. And I get that. Yeah, I understand the ramifications, not just as far as from a team standpoint, but from a league standpoint as well. And this goes into what I wanted to talk to you about because and now the players know exactly what, what they're facing down there in Orlando. There's not as much guesswork as there was a week, two weeks ago when we first started talking about this. They now know what the, you know is going to be required by the NBA, especially if they want to go ahead and 
maybe step out for a uh, Black Lives Matter protest that may be taking place in Florida or they can fly to a local state nearby or anything like that. They can't come back and automatically pop back in. They need to go ahead and self-quarantine for a few days, four to ten days specifically, and all the other things that are out there. In fact, also from a standpoint of you know older coaches – you know, mm-hmm. they've been very up in arms, especially because Adam Silver on national television stated that, you know, they were going to be you know, putting some guidelines in place for coaches. And, you know, you can't do that as far as any type of uh, restriction because there are certain laws against that uh, as far as against age or anything like that. So the Coaches Association kind of put the whammy on that. But, you know, still the NBA had to do some backtracking. And it wasn't out of any – you know, ill will. It was just out of, you know, looking out for these coaches. But again, if these coaches are willing to go ahead and undergo that risk, like a Popovich, like a Dan Tony, like an Alvin Gentry, who I think are the three oldest coaches, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. If they're willing to take that risk and the teams to say, you know what, let's do it. Let's do it. We need our coach. I don't know how you can stop them from doing so or anybody that's of any importance that wants to be part of that 37 man woman uh man or woman contingent that is going to Orlando for each team. Yeah, it's just so much to to take in because and again, that's why Adam Silver if he wasn't bald, he would be bald now. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure he's had a lot of long days trying to you know, just put all this together, talking to health experts, talking to players and and coaches and ownership. But at the end of the day, it all comes down to money. And, you know, there's a great debate about whether they should be playing or not. Some people are just like, just cancel the season. But, you know, we live in America and, you know, it's a capitalistic society. So... <laughs> Nine hundred million is a lot of money on the table, and so, almost five hundred million of that goes to the players under the fifty-fifty split. Yeah, so I don't know, man. It's it's tough because there's so many. Like I keep saying, there's so many different factors. I mean, you have the players' injury. You may have a, sh- a short off season. Will you start up next year? I mean, I'm. I don't envy Adam Silver and his staff for the hours that they put in trying to put this together. Absolutely, because it is very detailed. In fact, mm-hmm. it had even the kind of blessings from Dr. Fauci looking at it and said if any league was trying to be successful at getting through this coronavirus with their season, it would have been the NBA because they're specifically outlining so many things in detail and trying to control things as best they can even though you're not supposed to say control things in this bubble format, it is a sense of control because you're not trying to intentionally control the players. You're trying to intentionally control the virus and keep that away from any of the players from getting sick. But like you were saying, if there are people out there that say it's just closed down the season, just shut it down, cancel it all all together. But that's another quandary because if they cancel the season, the owners can pull out the force majeure and rip up the CBA. Yeah. But the part that I thought was hilarious was they can't play doubles in ping pong, but they can play defense. Like, like what? what's the difference? Yeah. It just is crazy. And, uh, you know, it makes it even crazier for Adam Silver because of the call that took place a week ago as we were recording this with Kyrie Irving and Avery Bradley and Dwight Howard and several other players, in fact, mm-hmm. rumored up to 100 players that are very concerned a lot about the social aspect of this and the social issues that need to be addressed in our society still even to this day that are being talked about and protested about every single day. And they want to know if they're not going to get, when they go to Orlando in this type of bubble, if they should make that commitment, they're saying maybe they shouldn't make that commitment and stay home and be part of a bigger movement while other players are saying, hey, we need to go because we need to earn a living. We need to earn money. We need to go ahead and be able to provide not only for our families, but be able to contribute monetarily and also make a statement for Black Lives Matter as far as the the foundations and, and so many great things that you can contribute to 
we can contribute more by playing. So you have this kind of tug of war mm. between it. And, you know, I know some of the flack has gone, well, actually a lot of flack has gone the way of Kyrie Irving because, in fact, he wouldn't even be playing. And this all, I mean, the, the rhetoric started when he was told he couldn't go down to Orlando because he's injured. And I know a lot of his past and things he said in the past, the flat earth and, you know, all the other things he said as far as his beliefs. And, and uh, But still, what he's saying now is very poignant. It's very important. And a lot of people are listening among the NBA. Avery Bradley, Dwight Howard. They're very set as far as their position right now. They're very uncertain as far as going. And, it, you know, there's so many other players that have not been named, I'm sure, feel the same way. Well, I personally don't know what sitting out does. I don't know if it helps. I mean, I think I mean, Kyrie even talked about playing and, you know, gathering a league together for, for the guys there. I was wondering what, you know, how is that going to bring out more awareness than maybe what the NBA would do? Or am I missing something? Well, I did see Taylor Rooks report that that wasn't true. Um, he wasn't involved with that. Okay. And it seems okay. like the, the writer for, I can't think of his name right now, that covers the Nets, um, he was the one that reported it, and it just seems like a lot of different people ran with it. I okay. also think Kyrie is low-hanging fruit. So I don't know if if that is true that he said that players need to start their own league or not. I agree with you, though, that he is a, a easy target uh, because of his past, uh, yeah. he said, and who he is and where he is right now. I, I agree with you on the fact that he is a specific target. But when individuals like Avery Bradley – come up to the forefront and speak out loudly on social media about this. I think that builds a lot more weight and has a lot of people saying, you know what, this is, you can't laugh this off. You can't joke this off. It's not, you know, I understand what Kyrie Irving has said in the past, but what Kyrie Irving is saying right now is real. And there's a lot of people like Avery Bradley that are right behind him on that. Well, I I do believe that Kyrie and Dwight needed Avery Bradley to add some credibility to what they're saying. I agree. I it would agree. be very easy to put those two in a box and say, well, you guys? I mean, based off of their past and, and how people feel about them. So Avery Bradley, I think, did add some credibility to what they were saying. But I still don't understand how – sitting out would would really change anything. I just feel like with the platform they have, with the lack of sports on TV, all the eyes would be on the NBA. I think that they could do more by playing than by sitting out. Because so unless they're Well, because you're thinking your games are going to be on TNT, more games are going to be on ABC. This is going yeah. to be something that's going to be on prime time very much. You know, a lot of, a lot of prime time games that are – going to be a lot of eyeballs more than ever on the NBA. Not more than ever, per se, but more than what we were seeing in the first part of the season. I mean, I I wouldn't say more than ever is a stretch. There's no sports on TV. I mean, it's been, as of today, 100 days since the NBA has been gone. And there's still like 41 days left. So, well, 41 days until the season is supposed to start up. And then people who watch baseball may start tuning into basketball because it doesn't look like there's going to be any baseball this summer. So, yeah, and and I think with everything that's going on, all the attention to the NBA from the social aspect and the basketball aspect, I, I don't think it's a stretch to say that the most eyes will be on the NBA now. Well, that, that could be very well said, uh, and as far as it could be a – well, for the league, it would be great, obviously, with all that many people watching it because the lack of things that are out there as far as sports to watch. Uh, but that's also great for the players if there's a message that they want to get across because the league right now, in its current shape and with the environment that we are in now, uh, the players have a great advantage of going ahead and using it as a platform for change even more so now than ever. Yeah, I mean, and we've talked about it before on past episodes that the NBA is by far first and foremost, you know, just first as far as like 
allowing players to be outspoken about social issues. And, and this, in my opinion, is just a bigger platform for the players and the league as a whole to stand behind what they've been saying about change and, and social issues. Well, I'll tell you what, there's going to be a lot of decisions made in the coming days, uh, and we'll keep you up to date right here on the show. Uh, very interested to see if who goes and who stays, whether it's for the coronavirus, whether it's to support the current movement that's out there. I'm very interested to see. And if Avery Bradley and Dwight Howard uh, you know, are two of the, the individuals that decide to stay, because they have to inform the league by the 24th, if I'm not mistaken, mm-hmm. whether or not they want to go ahead to Orlando. That's a pretty big hit for the Lakers. It's, I understand it's not LeBron and AD, but still, those are two better players as far as in their rotation that play solid defense for them. I'm, like everybody else, is curious to see if anybody actually does decide not to play. Because, I mean, let's be honest, even if you decide not to play, you may not be penalized at that point, but I think it will be a hit on your reputation. I think it will have an impact on your free agency, on how teammates view you privately. I mean, I think people would understand a little bit, but at the same time, I think if you're an owner or, or a general manager, I think that it will have a negative impact on, on your reputation. Even because- someone like Joe Ingles, who has family members at home, I think they ha- he has a son or, or a daughter that is a health challenge that mm-hmm. if he should bring it home, as far as coronavirus could impact that but his child. You, you, that kind of time is your family issues. And I'm sure there are other players out there. I'm sure with, for in fact, J- JaVale McGee and also as well James Harden, they have suffered from asthma. So mm-hmm. they're at higher risk as far as if contracting the coronavirus. I, I don't know. I mean, I understand that as far as, you know, other teammates looking down on them possibly going forward in the future, but I, I can see it as uh, just as much as if you want to go ahead and support the social cause, supporting the health aspect of it, and you decide not to go would be very warranted. And I'm not, I'm not necessarily sh- sure that it, you should look down on that as well, or if you're a teammate of theirs going forward. Yeah, I don't think publicly anybody will, but, I mean, just think about it. If James Harden decides not to play, I think that will put a stain on his reputation, even if he's doing it for the right reasons. I mean, a lot of times fans or even the media aren't logical, you know? Like, I mean, remember Vince Carter was criticized for wanting to be at his graduation because it was a playoff game. And, yeah, it's a playoff game, and he played more playoff games than he had graduations. But in... The way the NBA is today, even in sports, period, you, you know, you're you're considered like a hero. Like, you know, I, I've seen the stories of guys playing the game the day a loved one passed away. And in reality, if it was your regular job, you wouldn't show up. Yeah. But if, like Isaiah Thomas, you know, when he played, when his sister passed away, he was, you know, I mean, a lot of people gave him credit for that, which he deserved. But it's it's a it's a double standard, I feel like, as far as athletes. Absolutely. I mean, you know, even as we were kids growing up, I mean, we had these jerseys on. Who did we idolize? You know, we didn't idolize, uh, you know, we idolized our family members, and then we idolized the players, mm-hmm. the players that we, we wanted to be like, uh, whether it was baseball, basketball, football, you know, whatever sport. I mean, we wanted – that's why we had the jerseys on our backs as a kid, and it's just – I understand that because they're looked up to by mm-hmm. so many millions of, of people, whether they're young or old. And I think now is a great time for them to go ahead and get across what they want to get across as a as a unit, as a group. And the NBA is willing to go ahead and, and pretty much say, you know what, the floor is yours. Mm-hmm. And, and go ahead and make your point. And like with all the eyes that you and I both think are going to be watching this, I think it's a great time to send that message and make sure that there's it's it's sent forward. And you know what? If it ruffles some feathers, so be it. Yeah, and I think some guys may not want to play. And it may not necessarily be all related to the health issues or, or social issues. 
It's just they probably mentally checked out in March. They didn't think that there was going to be, you know, an ending to the season. So for them to get back into that mind frame of competing and ramping it up after you haven't done anything for a few weeks. And I mean, think if you're like the Suns, you know, like you have to go, don't you have, I think they have to win like every single game just to have a shot. So it's pretty unrealistic for that to happen. But imagine you have to ramp it up and get in shape for a couple weeks and then go back to doing what you were doing before. So I think some guys may just be mentally checked out, and then also some players may, if they have a, if they're a free agent, like it hasn't really been talked about too much. But if you're Jason Tatum or Donovan Mitchell, and you have, I mean, we don't know what the cap is going to look like next year, but let's just say it's based off of the projected numbers. They could sign for 180 million dollars this off season and Giannis could sign for a quarter of a million. It's kind of, I mean, a quarter of a billion. It's kind of crazy to hear that number thrown out there, but it may be smart for them to sit out and risk injury, but the backlash would be horrible. If you say, Hey, you know what? I want to maximize my earning potential. I don't want to take the risk. So I'm not going to play after sitting out a couple months. So, but I think peer pressure will force guys to play, even if they really don't want to play, because some guys don't want to be the one that sits out. Or, you know, like, I can't imagine a Laker deciding, you know what, I'm going to be the one, especially like a key rotation player that says I'm going to be the one or, or be the one that gets the blame for people saying, well, you know what, if such and such play, LeBron would have won his – fourth title that's true and but there's still players like devin booker deandre aiden bradley beal like you said have to gear up have to go down there be in the bubble gear up go ahead work out get in shape get mentally motivated to play maybe two three meaningful games at best and then for the rest of the time maybe get sat out because the team doesn't want to go ahead and risk their health long term so basically they would be there for what two three games uh, Mm -hmm. realistically and meaningfully so that that's a hard one that's a hard one for me to go ahead and say you know what Uh, i I need you down there because if (laughs) the odds are way against teams like washington and phoenix to go ahead and make even the 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 play-in games per se yeah, and even for, like, i give you an example. I was at a gym earlier today, and I, I won't name the players because I don't want anybody to get in trouble. But I've seen, in this particular gym, I've seen four or five NBA players come in and work out with the trainer. So today there was a guy that came in to work out as, I mean, he was an all-star. And, I, you know, I'm a videographer, so I had my camera there, and they were like, you can't film because – the NBA doesn't want players working out with third-party trainers. They would prefer the guys working out at their team facilities where they can work out in groups of three. But this hurts the guys that are not going to be invited to Orlando. So if you're, you know, you play for one of the teams that's not invited, they don't want you to work out with a trainer in whatever city that you're staying in. They they would and I get it. They would prefer you to work out at the team facility where it's more controlled environment, but you can't expect the players to stay in the city that they play in year round. So I wonder how that's yeah. going to affect I mean, everything. Because if you're on the Knicks, do you? Mm-hmm. I mean, does every every player on the Knicks stay in New York? No, and I mean, there's there's a few. Knicks players that I know at least last summer there were three guys on the Knicks that lived in Dallas and you could find them playing pickup, you know, pretty regularly. And so right now, I mean, you know, a lot of videographers are, you know, they're trying to get their followers up because they're in these gyms and they're posting videos of of players working out, which, you know, was pretty popular on YouTube in the summer. But some of the guys have been playing, but I saw a lot last week 
But I noticed that this week I didn't really see too many videos of guys playing pickup. And I think a lot of it is is related to teams don't, you know, they've called the players and they've told the trainers that you can't be posting videos and the league doesn't want you guys working out with a third-party trainer. We're signaling the ref for a quick timeout, but we'll be back with more of the Lakers Fast Break Podcast. Check out what's been going on with the Pop Culture Cosmo Show and the PCC Multiverse. That is by far my favorite because it's also character driven and the stakes are high and there's much more of a mystery and intrigue to it. A game like Wolfenstein, which people are saying are one of the most socially important video games of the past 10 years. Catch our shows on radio worldwide seven days a week or at any time on Podbean, Spotify, Apple Podcasts or on over 30 more podcast outlets. One of the things I wanted to talk to you about when it comes to the NBA is What they need to do, not on the court necessarily for racial equality, because as you see, it's what, 85% African-American, if I'm not mistaken, 80 to 85, yeah, something like that. It's off the court. It's the coaching staff. It's the front office. It's the ownerships or general manager, general part, you know, partner, whatever you want to call it these days, general managing partner, things like that. What I want to ask is, what steps does the NBA need to take in order to get to that point? I mean, we saw the Lakers the other day. Uh, you know, I had a great hiring of Dr. Carita Brown. Uh, she is going to be there as a director of racial quality and making sure hiring practices are done accordingly and they're done in a proper fashion to get the best candidate from whatever background possible to go ahead and fill the roles in the future for the Lakers organization, which I think is a great step. And then he had Jeannie Buss today making statements about trying to get more racial quality in the league and understand that the negative effects that racism has in our society. It's a point where I hear one of the things that Avery Bradley and Dwight Howard and and, uh, Kyrie Irving and all the other players say is they're not hearing from these owners. They're not hearing from the majority of them as far as speaking out on this uh, or contributing Mm -hmm. money or things of that nature. I was listening to Hoops Collective podcast, and that's the feedback that they're getting from players because they have a better insight than what I can get currently because they have they have more players that they can speak to. And that's what they're hearing is that the hierarchy of the NBA is not doing enough in regards to this. So I want to hear from you. What steps do they need to take? What steps do they need to start going into to go ahead and have a better environment for a league that's started to take that step, but still has a long way to go? Well, as far as hiring practices, I can tell you that just firsthand from my personal experiences, how difficult it is for an African-American to rise up the ranks. And I'm not going to blame it on racism or, or anything like that. It may have a little bit to do with it, but one of the issues that I've seen is that I mean, a lot of people want to work in sports. It's very, very competitive to work for an NBA team. I can guarantee you right now, if the Lakers post an internship unpaid, you may get hundreds or thousands of applicants. And so what makes it harder for African Americans, in my opinion, is in order to work in sports, you're usually going to have to work a long time without getting paid. And it affects, I mean, it affects African-Americans or blacks a lot. I mean, it affects everybody. And sometimes it just depends on how supportive your family or your, or your friends or whoever is to support you until you finally start generating income. So like from my experience, I, I lived in LA 2000, I got an internship with the Clippers. It was supposed to be the 2010-2011 season. And one of the requirements was I had to, it had to be for a class credit. And I had to be able to attend all the home games, obviously, be there during the day, and it was unpaid. So at the time, I may have been like 28 or 29 years old. 
it was something that I wanted to do, something that I felt like, all right, I spent my 20s working a job that I liked. It was okay, but it wasn't something that I was passionate about. And I knew that I wanted to get into sports. And so what I ended up doing was say, okay, I'm going to take this internship. And I happened to know somebody that knew another person that worked in HR. So I got the internship with the Clippers. And LA is expensive, as you can imagine. Lived there 25 years, yes. (laughs) And it's even crazier now than it was 10 years ago. And so I I had my own apartment. And what ended up happening was I got the internship. But not only did I have to go to class, and I took like some random PE class at a community college in East LA just for the credit. But I still had to be in class three times a week during the day. Then I had to be in the office and then they had games at night. And, you know, this game schedule is, it's not like you can say, well, Monday, Wednesday, Fridays. And I ended up like taking a gamble on myself and hoping that I could make things work. And I I had this mindset that I'm going to be the hardest worker there. I'm going to work so hard that, they're going to hire me. I, I, it's going to work out. Well, it didn't work out. I ended up <laughs> getting evicted and I had to move back to Dallas. And so from there, I ended up working, getting internships with the Texas Legends. It was the Mavericks G League team first year. I drove the team bus. I did laundry. I did film. I was in the office all day and all of this was an unpaid internship. Not a lot of people can maintain, you know, a a living doing that. So I ended up getting a job working graveyard shift at a gas station. And I had a college degree and, but it was kind of humbling for me to get a job at a gas station working overnight just because I wanted this internship so bad. The good thing for me is that when I was living in LA, I had a house in Dallas that I owned and my brother and his wife were staying there because they had a newborn baby. So I ended up staying with my brother and his wife and their baby. But if it wasn't for that, I wouldn't have been able to really put in, been able to put in the hours and and made a name for myself. But a lot of people aren't in that situation. And so the people that, whose parents may have the resources and funds to say, well, you know what? You can stay here until you get your your job. And for a lot of black people, they don't have that same luxury. Like I have a friend, he played professional basketball overseas. You know, he was married with a wife and her family allowed him to stay with, you know, his family to stay with her parents until he got where he wanted to be. And he's an assistant coach in the NBA now. But it took him like eight years to get to that point. And so the investment that her family or his family made in him to pursue his dreams allowed him to get to that point where he's making, you know, whatever he makes as an assistant coach in the NBA. A lot of black people aren't going to have the same luxury. So they're going to get weeded out in the process because they don't have the resources to play the long game until you get paid. That's a... That's hard, man. That that's t- just to hear that, and uh, you know, you, you hear stories such as yourself, and such as, you know, what's going on as far as the work that needs to go behind the scenes, and how much harder it is uh, in that case. And that's why things need to change, and things need to be, you know, get better. So we need to have more decisions of this. But as I, I was talking about with the Lakers. Do you like the signing? Do you like the the addition of Dr. Corita Brown? Because hopefully it sends a message to the rest of the league that you need to start thinking about this carefully. You need to start getting people in place who can make these changes happen so you don't have to have Rafael Barlow's having to do so much to just try and find a place in the league. Well, it's tough because, I mean – not saying that it's it's a, a racial issue like the stuff that I, I went through. It's just it's a numbers game. And a lot of people get weeded out because they can't afford to work a whole season or two seasons without having any income coming in. It's similar to what I was going through in Hollywood. And I work for a special effects company. But in order to go ahead and get in front of the camera or 
you know, really go across the street to work at Paramount Studios, which is where I really wanted to go, you have to go, like you said, you have to go and be an extra or you start in as far as being an unpaid assistant. Holding and, the boom yeah, mic. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And just, just that whole nine yards. So mm-hmm. you have to do that just to even earn your way, yep. uh, most likely in the Hollywood and movie industry as well. So, yeah, that's perfectly understandable. It's just extremely hard. And like you said, it's always a numbers game that you're up against. Yeah. And that's why I said I can't blame it on systematic racism or anything like that. Just be, But it's so competitive and – you have to be able to be really, really patient and have a lot of faith in yourself. And more than likely, you're going to need some type of help or resources to help you survive in life until you get to that point where you can get a steady paycheck. But as far as like with the Lakers, if they're higher, I think it's a good idea. I mean, I like it, what it's for. My only fear is that, I mean, I guess it's a good thing, but... I mean, I know the NBA is a copycat league, so I imagine other teams are going to follow and, and make similar hires. But I wonder, are teams going to just make similar hires for the PR behind it? Because nobody wants to be the – there's only five teams left that haven't made this position with a, a diversity hire. I feel like – and this is probably a little controversial, but I feel like it happened a little bit in a sense with – even the G League, some teams didn't want a G League team, but you don't want to be the only ones without. Even when they started hiring women, not saying that the women aren't qualified, but I feel like some people felt like, you know what, this looks good. This is a good PR move. We need to hire a woman on our staff because we don't want to be the only team that doesn't hire women. And so I wonder, are some of the women actually getting the opportunity to show their knowledge and what they're capable of doing as opposed to kind of, I don't know, being the token on a staff. And that's something that we'll have to see going forward because there are more and more women that are going on these staffs. Becky Hammond is the most Mm -hmm. prominent name for the San Antonio Spurs that gets mentioned. She should be considered a candidate for a head coaching job, maybe as early as this summer there's going to be head coaching jobs. It'll be interesting to see whether she's just going to go there to get interviewed just to have an interview or if she's really going to be strongly considered or ultimately hired for that position because it looks like Tim Duncan is going to get the job when Popovich leaves San Antonio. And Tim Duncan isn't a guy who, at least to my knowledge, was someone who we always heard about. He's going to be a great coach. He's yeah, going he did, to be we a didn't coach. even know he was interested in it. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. So that that's another interesting story topic on the, on another episode, but yeah, as far as like what the Lakers are doing with the the hire, I think it's I think it's great. Um, even though I read a little bit about the the title in one of the articles, it sounds like right now her job is mostly to is it to inform or teach the staff and about just the the racial inequality or systematic racism or just kind of like make, I don't know, for lack of a better term, make white people or non-black people aware of the issues that African-Americans are going through. But it needs to be something more. It needs to evolve into something more. She needs to, if she does a great job at this, she needs to be looked at as far as becoming a vice president or Mm -hmm. becoming a president of operations or becoming a GM or becoming, you know, something of that nature where she needs to be put in a spotlight where she can do more and other individuals need to be put in those same spots as well. It needs to just, it not need, it just needs to be something just besides that. It needs to evolve into something more as well. Correct. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I guess the one issue that I have, I think on one hand is good that, these particular jobs are opening up but uh, if and it's probably what Avery Bradley is speaking on is that why does it take something to come up for this particular job to open up and so I guess you can even look at the situation with the Mavericks when they had like you know a whole PR nightmare of what was going on in in you know in the front office but they ended up hiring an African-American woman to be I don't know her exact title, but I want to say she's the president of the team. 
very nicely. I've had a chance to, to meet her, but I think there's a lot of people wondering why does it take that for that hire to happen? Why isn't this considered in the first place? Like, like you said, it's all about timing. Mm-hmm. Uh, like they make the announcement now the Lakers do in the middle of what's going on. Why couldn't this have been done last year at this point in time, you know, yeah. or the year before? Why does it have to be a situation where it leads up to now before things are done? I agree with you that it's a great step in the right direction, but it's always about timing and optics. And, you know, the NBA is a lot about optics. Mm -hmm. And so you're not sure about the full intentions of the, these teams that do these things, including the Lakers, you know, which had its own fiasco earlier, a couple months ago when they applied for the loan and, you know, they're a how many billion dollar company that they're worth. And, you know, they uh, had to give it back and all that. So you're never sure of the motivations of any of these teams. I'm glad that they're doing it. I'm hoping they'll give her the chance and the platform to not only do good in her position now, but going forward, if she does well, and she's given that opportunity that, you know, if she wants to go ahead and take it, that she'll be given a charge either here or with another team on a, even higher platform so she can make even more of an impact. So that will lead more teams to go ahead and make those same good choices as well. I agree hundred percent. We'll be back with more of the Lakers fast break podcast. Needing an edge for your fantasy football team. Listen to the guys at inside sports, fantasy football. For insight that will help you reach your league championship. That's Inside Sports Fantasy Football. Check it out today on your favorite podcast outlet. Well, my friend, we've talked about some heavy issues so far in this podcast, but before we head on out, you know, NBA draft junkies, my friend, we got to talk about some NBA draft stuff before we head on out. So I know it's a way off the beaten path sometimes, especially what's going on, but. You know, you've got your great site, NBA Draft Junkies, and I know you've got some mock drafts that you're working on. And can you just give listeners out there kind of a sneak peek of not necessarily, you know, okay, this guy's rising, but this guy's falling, but some of the individuals that you're looking at that are making a change in your eyes one way or the other? Well, you know, I think right now with there's so much time on your hands, at least for a lot of people that do this draft stuff, you're watching guys and all of a sudden you're like, you know what, I think I like this guy better than others. Um, or I was wrong about this particular player. Because it's really hard to say if a player is moving up on draft boards because we haven't seen them. Like, we haven't had an opportunity to watch guys play in over 100-something days at the minimum. So it's all based off of just your opinion. I think anybody that says a guy's rising on multiple mocks, I mean, I just want to know where he's getting that information from. But I, at least for me, like I mentioned earlier, I was at a gym today and I saw a couple guys work out, and there was one guy who I was really impressed with. And so, um, but because he's the last player that I've seen, I have to make sure that I'm not moving him too high up because, you know, I've seen him live and I saw him recently. That doesn't mean that he's better than another person that I had above him who I can't see. So, it's kind of tough to, to like, you know, base anything off of anything other than just kind of change, changing your mind because you've taken a, a deeper look in the film. But this player has looked a lot better than what you've seen before and uh, what you saw now in current workouts. Well, I had, I had questions about his shot as far as, like, the percentage he shot. Was it real? Or, or was it something that could be sustained? And so just kind of watching this guy work out a couple of times, I can see both sides because his form is a lot different when he shoots threes as opposed to when he's shooting jumpers inside the arc. And so I see why there's a, uh, such a big difference in, in his percentages. But it's still kind of tough to determine, you know what I'm saying, like if three-point percentage that he shot in college – is what his future is, or is it going to be based off of the, the percentage that he shot on pull-up jumpers and free throws? So it's it's tough, but watching him live, I feel like, man, you know, I think I like him better than I did before. That's a but, good way to gauge that. 
again, I have to make sure that I'm not just basing it off of because I haven't seen anybody live in so long. But are there are some movers and followers in your eyes, uh, I'm, I'm assuming, correct? I mean, there has been for me. I've already started to get some ideas. Man, maybe I put him a little too high. Yeah. Man, maybe I put him a little bit too low. Uh, you know, I've gotten a lot of feedback, so it gave me a second chance to look at players both either which way. And, uh, you know, it allows me to chance to reassess, and I'm sure you're doing that process as well. Yeah, and I think, like, if no matter what, how much time it is, you're always going to change your draft. I mean, you know, if they move the draft back a month, your mock draft may look totally different, and it's just because you have more time to to look at guys or maybe there's something that you didn't notice before. Sometimes you can – I mean, we're all human. We can be influenced by – what we've read on other mock drafts or other boards and, and so on. So, but that's, that's the beauty of it is that nobody's right when it comes to these mock drafts. I mean, you can be right on a couple of players here and there, but even the experts or even the guys that get paid hundreds of thousands of dollars to predict a player, they get them wrong often. So that, that's the beauty of it. And it's funny because you hear Chad Ford on his podcast talk about the extensive research that he does, the fact that he had access to all these workouts. He would be there early in the morning, late at night. He would be going ahead and, and observing these players a lot more than, let's say, you or I can mm -hmm. because he has access. and he, has, he had at that time the ESPN backing to go ahead and follow all these players. And even he made mistakes, and, and even he fell in love with players that unfortunately didn't pan out for one reason or the other, not necessarily because of an injury, just because of performance level as well. At the end of the day, you can't predict how well a 19-year-old is going to play long-term once he has millions of dollars in the bank. I had a friend, an NBA player once tell me, and it, it made so much sense, he says, you know how hard it is to come in here every day and do these workouts when I can look at the map and be anywhere I want to be in the world within the next 24 hours? He's like, the people who make it and are successful usually have another level of drive to them that pushes them to how they succeed. I mean, you know, you, you look at Kobe, and yes, he was talented. He was given a lot of natural gifts. But it was his, his drive and his work ethic, all of that, which made him, you know, one of the best players to ever play the game. Well, I think there may be other guys who may have been just as naturally talented and they, they didn't come close to his accomplishments. So that's kind of hard to predict. Exactly. It's what are the, what's the drive? What's in here? What's in here as far mm -hmm. as that's concerned? Yeah, I, I can't agree with you any more on that, and, and obviously we saw a lot with Kobe uh, in that aspect, and hopefully we'll see more players with that kind of drive going forward. I mean, we see it right now with LeBron. Uh, we see it right now with Giannis. Uh, we see it right now at times, although he's very quiet, but there's still, once you get them on the court, you see Kawhi's determination and uh, willingness to go ahead and take over a game and let his actions speak for himself, so that's another way of, of doing it, and uh, you know, hear all these stories. Uh, it's great because you, you hear all these stories of all these, these players in their backgrounds of when they were coming up on whether or not they would make it in the league. And, yeah, uh, Chad Ford's stories are very funny at times as far as exactly what he thought of these players one way or the other. And you hear all these other stories. Well, these one thing this pandemic has caused is all these redraftable shows. Yeah. And I, I listen to him, and I think, my gosh, I was probably thinking the same way my, myself. So, you know, at that point in time about X player, X player, you know, it's, hindsight's great in 2020. It's great to play that armchair quarterback. But, yeah, when you're in the middle of it and you're looking at it, and yeah, it's, it's just so funny to, to see now some of the players that you, you were so behind that you thought would make it didn't pan out and vice versa. Oh, yeah. man, this guy's terrible. Why are they drafting him? And the next thing you know, he's an all-star player. Yeah, and I, I always feel like a lot of the reasons why guys make it or don't make it to the their maximum potential usually isn't talent. It's usually like the drive. I mean, situation is important also. But some guys, their dream was to make it to the NBA, and that's exactly what they did if they made it to the NBA. 
and they'll stay long enough to get a check. They don't necessarily have the desire like a Kobe or a Kawhi or or LeBron. I mean, like LeBron is probably one of the best examples. I mean, he had over a hundred million dollars in endorsements before he played a single game, but yet he was still driven by something. And it's not you can't say he's not motivated by money because he's made a lot of money and 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 you know he's continued to make a lot of money. He always puts himself in position to make more money. But there's something that's driving him, and I mean, he's been driven by legacy, and that's what's I'm mean, on top of. Like I said, his ridiculous skill set and, and value given talent, but he's driven by creating a legacy, and that's what makes him spend so much money on his body, puts in the work. And if you're 17, and if you didn't know anything about basketball and you watched him play, you, you wouldn't even know that he has that much mileage on his body. So, But that type of drive, and, and you can't teach that. Like, there's, there's nothing that you can do to give somebody that type of tenacity and drive. So that's what I love about the guys that are great at what they do. I mean, from your LeBrons to your Kobe's to your Jordans, these guys have something special inside of them on top of, like I said, their natural gifts. And you can't determine that in a draft. You may have some ideas, but you just don't know how a person is going to act once they have millions of dollars in the bank, especially a teenager. That's true. That's true. And one of the things I want to talk to you about on next time we talk is LeBron's legacy. If he were to get to that fourth title, third different team, et cetera, et cetera, that you're hearing about right now with the rhetoric, we'll know more or we'll have a clearer idea on exactly who is heading to Orlando, who's not. So those are some great issues to talk about as well. So we're going to talk about that. But before we head on out, my friend, you know, I'd save it best for last. And that is your tenure, as I know you would do an outstanding job, no matter how much James Dolan would probably try to undermine you the entire <laughs> time. But I want to hear your thoughts in your time doing the program that you can now check out at NBA Draft Junkies with you serving as New York Knicks GM and deciding the future, or at least the short-term future, for where the New York Knicks should do. Your time doing that, how much did you enjoy it, and the feedback that you got from the Knicks fans, which you say are among, and which is true, are among the most vocal out there in the NBA. It was fun. If, if you haven't had a chance to check out the video, it's on my YouTube channel, and it's on my website also. I used to play NBA 2K a lot, but when I played 2K, it got to the point where they just added so many different controls and stuff to the game with the Euro step, hop step, fade away. It got a little too complicated for me. But I would always get the game to play GM mode because I wanted to see if I could put together a team. So I used to simulate a team and I would make the moves in free agency and try to take the worst team and rebuild. But that was fun to me. And so I had this genius idea about a week ago. And I wanted to add some content to my site that was creative and different, but I didn't want something that was super corny. I also wanted to show a little bit of personality because, and no offense to the other guys that are doing draft stuff, I just feel like it's all a little bit redundant and it's become pretty nerdy in a sense. He's a great dunker. <laughs> yeah. So I decided, well, you know, let me put on a suit. And I, it's going to be tough to try to find colors to match for every team, but I ended up finding one Nick's colors and, I named myself the general manager of the Knicks, and I talked about the changes that I would make, who I would look to draft, and how I would change the team. And it was fun. And I it took a lot of time to put it together, but it was it was fun, and I thought the feedback was pretty good. A lot of people didn't like it. A lot of people said, well, this is why I'll never be hired as the general manager of the Knicks, especially when I said that if I'm New York, I would make a play for Chris Paul to try to bring some leadership to that organization. And, I mean, I don't un- – this is just my opinion, though. I don't understand why New York fans would be against it, especially if you saw what he did for Oklahoma City. And, I mean, if Chris Paul leads the Knicks to a 500 record in the eighth seed in the playoffs, that's a successful year in New York. So why not? But, yeah, it was fun just to, you know, kind of step outside the box and be creative and – I have another team that I release shortly. And actually, by the time this podcast is released, I will be the new general manager of the Cleveland Cavaliers. And 
that's a mess also, but I think I can fix it. You can catch what he's doing today at NBA Draft Junkies. But with the Lakers and everybody going forward, it's going to be a very important few days. We're going to find out who's going to be a part of the bubble in Orlando. We're going to see if anybody is staying out for whatever reason and if there's some important reasons why. So we're going to go ahead and keep you updated. Raphael, I hope you come back next week so we can update everyone on this. I'm looking forward to it. And I'll tell you what, it's always great to have you here. Once again, it's Raphael Barlow from NBA Draft Junkies. Check out all the great stuff he's doing today, NBADraftJunkies.com, NBA Draft Junkies on YouTube, and NBA Draft Junkies wherever you get your podcasts. You just got to go ahead and check out all the great stuff that he's doing there, even as the general manager of the New York Knicks. Well, Raphael, it's been great talking to you as always. Thank you for watching. Thank you for listening right here at the Lakers Fast Break Podcast. <laughs>